All right. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Andrew Plow. You're here for Many Hands Make Light Work. Empower your coworkers to develop and maintain PowerShell. Make sure that my mic is muted. OK. Um, so who am I? So as I said, my name is Andrew Pla. I'm a human. Um, I like emphasizing that. Uh, I have a sysadmin background, um, tool making, AD, 365 stuff, like an SMB type deal. Um, pretty fun stuff. Uh, it was a type of situation, SMB, I was the only one kind of learning PowerShell. Uh, so that's kind of my background. I'm also a, a co-host of the PowerShell podcast, which is a PowerShell podcast that we do to give back to the community and talk about all things PowerShell. Um, and this is a bit relevant. So in 2018, I won the PowerShell scholarship, um, which was a huge deal for my career, like 2018, four years ago, a bit earlier in my career. Um, like I said, a sysadmin, but not really at an organization with any people willing or able to instill kind of like higher order advice, um, like what you'd see in the PowerShell community. There's a lot of people with a pretty good perspective on things. And I, I didn't have access to that at work, but I, was, I ran across a Don Jones tweet on Twitter where he was mentioning that there was a scholarship program for people who uh, are interested. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and yeah, so I saw that tweet and it was like, if you want to apply, submit a letter explaining your experience with PowerShell and what you'd like to get. And I got a babysitter and sat down with my wife for a bit and brainstormed over how I should express this because it was a pretty uh, important opportunity for me in my life. Like my work would never have sent me to a place like this. It just wasn't on our radar and our budgets, anything like that. So after that, it uh, really jump-started my career. So after receiving that scholarship, even before attending the conference, I got a lot of support from the community. Um, and I had the excuse of the conference coming up to really push forward and learn PowerShell. And this whole situation opened up an entire new world to me that I did not know existed. I had no clue that any of this type of stuff ever existed before being exposed to the PowerShell community and receiving all that support. Um, so whenever I got started, I just dabbled. And as I took more risks and did more, I felt like I belonged and had a sense of belonging in the community. And it was really impactful to my career to be part of something bigger than myself and bigger than just being a sysadmin at a small place. Yeah, so during that process, I received a lot of mentors, right? So they announced that I was a scholarship winner and a lot of people reached out to me and were supportive. And when I'd, I, I had multiple people I could go to um, as mentors, um, I received help from all different types of people. And you know that, that saying, you stand on the shoulders of giants. And I am very much so uh, a result of that in a very tangible way um, in the PowerShell community. I'm very thankful for that. Um, yeah, having that support system uh, in my journey, it played a huge role. Uh, from being able to face my fears and speak at the, uh, do a lightning talk at the first conference that I got the scholarship to, I wouldn't have been able to do those things without just a little bit of support, just a little bit of encouragement, and the safety that having a community like this creates. And that safety is quite powerful, because people are willing to take risks if you give them that safety. Um, and oh, it's been such a fantastic journey to go through. So without these people helping out and teaching me, I would not be where I am today. Um, thank you so much to <laughs> the support of the community. I felt, safe, I felt safe to take risks and make mistakes. Um, and once I really had that sense of safety, I was really able to grow. I had reasons to push forward and really learn PowerShell and take it a bit more seriously. Um, yeah, it was awesome. I'm very appreciative for that. So moving forward, uh, back in 2018, I met a certain someone, that fellow over there, Jordan Hammond. Um, met him in 2018. I was a fan of his. He does some YouTube stuff. And I now, four years later, officially work at PDQ, um, which is a big deal for me. It was a job I really wanted. And it's really cool to kind of come full circle. Thank you to PDQ for sending me here. OK. So the purpose of this talk, I kind of want to set some guidelines as to what we're going to be shooting for here. So. One thing that I had a thought of when I was at my previous job developing PowerShell, and as the pretty much the only one who's into PowerShell, I had a thought, I'm creating all these tools, but I'm not going to stay at this company forever. What's going to happen when I leave? What's going to happen to these tools that I have put some time into, that I have made maintainable, I've developed in a way that I want them to be supported? Am I going to get a new job and have just wasted three years tool writing? Are all my tools going to die as soon as I leave? That I didn't like that situation. I didn't feel comfortable spending time automating things. Like, I was getting paid to do it. I didn't feel comfortable doing that if there wasn't like a future for it, um, a future for my projects. Uh, so I got thinking. And well, I'll 
skip this slide. Yeah, congrats, you got a new job, you did some stuff. But when it comes to solving that problem, you could think to clone yourself, literally, but that's not something that is possible. So I got to thinking, what's the next best thing? Well, uh, the next best thing is to empower others, is to sort of duplicate your efforts by teaching, because you can't actually clone yourself, but you can impart the lessons that you've learned to others. You can prevent them from making the same mistakes that you've made. Um, and that's huge for efficiency. Um, and efficiency is a word that you'll hear a lot. Yeah, efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. Um, so yeah, my, my journey, or my goal here is to share my journey as it relates to interacting with others. Because as time went on, I kind of realized that was what was kind of holding me back a little bit was getting that adoption at work, was getting the help desk people to be interested in contributing, to be not intimidated by what was going on. Um, so yeah, today I'll, I'll kind of talk about what brought me success and the mistakes that I made along the way. So hopefully you can avoid those and you can impart some of the things that brought me success uh, in whatever situations you have where you're trying to empower your coworkers to develop and maintain your code. Okay, so initial experiences. So this kind of story begins maybe like four or five years ago, about the time I was kind of dabbling into PowerShell, getting the scholarship and stuff, and automating some things and getting some really good feedback at work. And that was really cool. I had always looked up to people who were doing PowerShell stuff and then to be doing it in my environment and having a positive impact and seeing my coworkers and my boss react, and it was really cool. Um, I did some, you know, like new user creation, reporting on licensing, some simple stuff that a lot of us do when we're kind of getting started, but has a huge impact. Um, and automation was a bit foreign to us, so this was a huge step in the right direction for us as an organization, um, and it really helped them out. Like me, of course, it's from my perspective, but as an organization, they're very fortunate for this whole situation as well. They're better off for it as well. Um, so yeah, um, thanks to the mentorship, I was able to like really inject and kind of use that enhanced perspective that my mentors gave me and some advice that they had and kind of took that with me. Um, and oh, the team was ready to learn. Uh, they had seen the successes I'd had, they had dabbled enough, ran some commands, thought about learning PowerShell, but they were ready to learn. And for me, I was a little bit scared, right? It, it's kind of scary to go from not mentoring people, not teaching people, not playing a role in that, to all of a sudden putting yourself out there and trying to teach people. Um, it's similar to, I guess, a lot of us when we try and post our first blog or reach out or do our first talk. It, it can be kind of scary. Um, and at the time, I, I wasn't quite ready all the way to take stuff internally. I was blogging and, and talking about my problems, and I was kind of mentally preparing, but I was afraid of like sharing my code with the team and, and kind of shattering that image that I had of them. We're like, oh, this Andrew learned PowerShell and he's automating all this stuff and it feels great. I kind of liked that. I liked that feeling of feeling needed. Um, I enjoyed the way I was perceived by my peers. So at this point in time, I had two kind of things going on. One, my team was treating me like a rock star. Right? That rock star thing that, that we hear referenced. Um, and at the same time, I was comparing myself to my mentors. Right? And that's going to make you feel kind of, it, it's a terrible situation there. Because on one hand, there's this facade of this great, oh, PowerShell, he, he can do it. Uh, we can give Andrew any problem, he can fix it with PowerShell. Versus the reality, which is where we all are, which is we have to just kind of figure it out and learn from our mistakes and make those mistakes. And over time, we get to a point where it may appear like we're really good, um, but it doesn't happen overnight, and it's not magic. Um, I was a bit, so I wasn't comfortable enough to allow myself to be vulnerable and honest about my skill level with things. Like I had a bit of personal value tied up in being good at PowerShell. Um, I have lots of valid reasons, as we all do, to kind of be afraid of failure, right? Because a lot of times in life, we have a lot of experiences, particularly earlier in life, hopefully not so much at work, where we fail and there's a consequence that's quite negative. And we have to kind of unlearn those. And, and it's OK that that takes time and we don't instantly have that. Um, and I, through this process, I kind of realized a lot of those things. Um, and being in that spot where I'm kind of stuck here, they have this image of a rock star here, the reality of me just being a human, oops, sorry, um, the support and the mentorship and just the guidance, just the reassurance, just the, hey, it's, you're doing a good job, the community that I felt, that uh, was enough to make me feel safe enough to kind of push out of the spot and kind of experiment and, and have um, the security systems to be able to do that. 
Um, now, at the time, I didn't necessarily know how much value I had as a person, except for those skills and contributions. I didn't know that I was fundamentally had value as a human, just for being there and trying. I, I thought that I had to really earn all my value and appreciation from my team, which is a pretty unhealthy place to find yourself in, and it's a bit stressful as well. So, well, I guess I can go through the slides now since they're not auto-advancing. Um, so yeah, it felt good to be valued by my peers. I worked hard to gain those skills, right? I made a lot of mistakes. I spent a lot of time getting better at PowerShell and investing in that. And um, that can lead you making other people think that you're performing magic, right? Because they don't know exactly how it's done, and they think that you just, poof, this magical thing. Well, it's not magical, right? It is just PowerShell. Um, and when you treat things like they're magic when they're not, it's, it's not a good situation, right? Uh, the rock star life is dangerous. We know that. We know that from rock star lives, but also I think that we've kind of seen that in IT. It's, it can lead to a lot of burnout. It can put you in a, in a situation that's not always connected with reality um, because we are all humans, right? We all have needs and we all have constraints and we all have skills. Um, and you also don't want the burden of being a rock star. Like maintaining that image, not fun. Like, it's much better to be a human, embrace your flaws, give yourself that flex room that all humans need to develop in life. Um, that was a pretty big one for me. Like, I, I feel like I've seen this in other people as well uh, through their process where there's a lot of people who they're the one person show at work and um, it can feel really good to, to be there. I know it, it did for me at least. Um, but what we should strive to do is instead of hiding the truth of the situation, share it with them. Um, it is unwise to make it seem like skills are unlearnable, because they're not. We learned them all. We were not born with whatever cool skills your coworkers appreciate. We had to work and learn and step by step get there. Um, and at the time, I wasn't really connected to that or understanding that that's kind of how it worked. Like, I really was just thinking that, oh yeah, these people who are in this place that I want to be are just different. They just have something inherently. Like, yeah, they must just be special compared to me. Um, but that's not the case. And yeah, this approach that I had, it led to the team uh, being hesitant and it made PowerShell seem unapproachable. So while it worked for my ego to feel really good, it also created this situation where I had tools that were really cool, but my team was a bit intimidated to contribute to them. And that's not fun, right? When we write PowerShell, we want to share it with others. Um, we don't want to just lonely contribute it. We want our tools to be used and appreciated and the way I was conducting things wasn't conducive to that. That wasn't encouraging other people to get involved and contribute to my projects. Um, but at the same time, I, I did learn some things. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the point, right? We try and learn from our mistakes. But as time went on, um, and I made those more mistakes, I would share those mistakes with my team, right? In an honest way, highlight in whatever process I'm doing or whatever thing that they're looking at me for, highlight the times that I messed up or the silly mistakes that I made or the 10 minutes I spent troubleshooting something that was silly and obvious and the same kind of thing that everyone does all the time. But when you don't have that perspective and you don't know that you're not alone, um, I know for me, I would think, oh, I'm just dumb. I just can't figure this out. And it wasn't until I heard from a lot of people in the community and others that, oh wow, that's not just you. We all have these similar things in common. We all have similar struggles. Um, that was a huge one for me because I was like, yo, if we're all the same, we have, we're just humans and we can all do this, well, that means I can do it. And if I can do it, that means really anyone can do it because if I'm not special and they're not special, well, then what I've done and what I achieve is also replicatable with someone else if, if I can kind of equip them with some of the similar tools. And that is very exciting and very efficient. I mentioned efficiency earlier, but when you can do that one time, that's awesome, that's one person but you do it again and maybe you empower them to the point where they're ready to start teaching others. And that, this is from my perspective, like me teaching one person, but in reality, I'm part of this community where there's people who've taught me, who have taught them, who are still teaching me. And it's just such a, a fantastic way and to me it's a very nice positive feedback system. Um, so yeah, I learned to share my mistakes with the team, honest ways to help break down the rock star image and highlight the truth of the situation, right? The truth is that it's not a rock star thing. The truth is that we can all do it um, and we don't want to scare them away by highlighting things that seem unapproachable. Encourage, not discourage. And they deserve your support. And support is such a huge thing. Um, it doesn't take much to keep someone on the right path. Like 
we all have a voice in our head, uh, or at least frequently, doubting us, like the imposter syndrome thing, kind of questioning where we are. Um, and if you can have a bit of external reassurance and safety and community, it can play a huge part in empowering someone to share the same message that you're trying to spread, um, which means less work on your part long term and higher impact. Okay, so I realized all those things. We're still, we haven't taught everyone on the team yet though. So some time had passed, they were still ready to learn, and I was finally confident enough to help and teach them. It wasn't just confidence, it was also, again, safety. I felt safe to be knocked down a peg. I felt safe knowing that, hey, let's say my PowerShell skills are crap. I'm still a person who's contributing to this team, trying my best, communicating, being empathetic, a lot of other things that um, are nice outside of just technical skills. Um, and yeah, I was ready to give this a go, and the team was ready to learn. Uh, as I mentioned, it felt scary, and what we did was we organized some regular trainings about PowerShell. Um, I equipped them with some tools, some books, you know, PowerShell in a month of lunches, some video materials, and just kind of left them on their way for a bit. Um, I, I was a bit scared uh, still, but I knew that the mild risk uh, would be worth it because so many people in this community show how teaching others leads to success for them. Like, it's great and all to feel like you're helping the world. That's awesome. But in reality, yeah, you're helping the world and those around you, but you're also helping yourself at the same exact time. Um, which I like that because you don't have to sell people on wanting to be a good person for whatever reason. Um, you get to sell them on efficiency, on their life. And that's something that we all, I think, care about is our experience of life. Um, and it's just really nice when you're going directionally correct, it typically affects everyone around you and you're all going in the right direction. And I love those positive feedback system. So we started doing these trainings and I was so excited to finally have my chance. I was just confident enough. I had enough successes. I learned a couple more tricks than just uh, writing some scripts. I, I wrote some modules. I was feeling good. Um, I was dabbling with some more advanced stuff, like playing around with VS Code and all kinds of cool stuff in there that typically when you're learning PowerShell, it's not the first thing you do. Um, but I was excited to share and, and teach them, right? Who doesn't love chatting about the cool stuff that they've done? Um, I would teach them a few things, a few concepts. Uh, maybe answer a question or two, and then things would slowly drift to me talking about the stuff I loved, the stuff that made me so excited, the awesome new module that came out, the cool way to create a PS custom object and add a member to it, or whatever the case may be. And at the time, I wasn't paying attention to how they were feeling. They were experiencing information overload. They were not engaged. They were not listening. It was awesome that I was having this great time talking about all this stuff that made me feel so good, but they just look at me with a glossed look over their eyes. And at the time, I, did, I wasn't paying attention. I was lost in the sauce, so to speak. I was excited. I was, oh, it's PowerShell. But I wasn't connecting with them or listening to them or being receptive to what their body language was telling me, which is a big deal because that can kind of put a division between you and someone else. Um, so yeah, I, went, I ended up going too fast too soon. And this was definitely a mistake by me that I, I've learned from since. You don't want to overwhelm people. Um, it, it's also quite helpful to communicate with them and understand what they're hoping to get out of a situation if you're teaching them something. Um, but yeah, so this led to them not getting the most out of things and me feeling like things weren't that good either. So I decided to kind of slow it down and move on. So I kind of stopped the trainings. Things kind of slowed down and died down like they do. We miss a meeting. We kind of stop. They're working on a project, whatever it is. Um, but they were armed with their own resources and I got busy on some stuff and it kind of fell off, but they were at the point where they could navigate PowerShell and create scripts and kind of that simple beginner area where they're kind of starting to dabble a little bit. Um, and this wasn't perfect. Like I just mentioned a mistake that I made with these interactions, but it was still a net positive. Like they were still in a better spot. We had something started. So even though I didn't do it perfectly and I could definitely do it better and I have done it better since then, I'm happy that I started. I'm happy that I took that chance. I'm happy that I, gave myself the opportunity to make those mistakes to then learn from it. If I never started, that wouldn't have happened. And so, you know, the saying, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, it's very important to just kind of get started sometimes. So, uh, sometime later, I don't know the timeline, maybe a year or two or something, we get a computer science graduate. He's finishing up his degree um, and is a Linux background, but 
is PowerShell curious. So open-minded, not kind of locked down, interested in learning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and there's also this other constraint with him. He had only six to nine months of employment with us. He was like a temp employee a few days a week while he um, finished up his degree. Cool. Uh, he was doing help desk stuff and kind of helping out, but he wasn't really enjoying it that much. Kind of wanted to get involved in some code stuff. Understandable. So I was working on a project to create an API module. I had like a ton of endpoints and stuff, and for me it was a really cool project. And I needed help writing some of the endpoints. And I thought about some other projects I could give him, but I want the code to be maintainable. I don't want it to be like kind of a rogue, rogue project. So I thought, how could I deliver? How can I get the most out of him with the least amount required, right? Because he doesn't need to necessarily learn all of PowerShell. Uh, he doesn't need to learn all the syntax, all the best practices. We kind of want to get a big return pretty quick. Like that wasn't kind of where his future was going, and that's fine. Um, but the code needs to be maintainable. And so what I went to was templating. Uh, I used you know, stucco and plaster because he didn't need to memorize or worry about the syntax. So I used uh, VS Code tasks to kind of help him scaffold the commands and you know, use begin process end blocks and help. I'd prompt him to enter in the help parameters. And then there was pester tests to make sure that everything was up to code. It, it was a nice little setup. Um, and I should shout out, Gilbert has a talk about stucco on Thursday or Wednesday, sometime later. Um, and you can find out a whole bunch of more information about Stucco and all those tools that I just mentioned. I will not be getting deep into them today, but it's pretty cool, to be honest. So um, we were able to get a bunch done. He had success writing those commands. It felt really awesome uh, for him, he shared this with me, to be able to contribute actionable code quickly, right? Like we were able to consume those, those commands in the module. It served a business need, and it felt good. Um, and not to mention that, by the time we were done, uh, he had a new degree of confidence. And I had someone who was comfortable and competent with PowerShell to a higher degree than we had before. Because I, I make it sound like this is a one-day thing. We probably dabbled for a while. I did some other projects related to it, but that was kind of the big takeaway. And I had a PowerShell champion internally. So I mentioned the help desk earlier and how we got to a certain point, and that was cool. But what really helped me drive things forward was having someone else who saw the same benefit as me, who saw that same, oh, it can be done, oh, anyone can do it, oh, PowerShell can return value and you can do it too. And because of that, the other people on the help desk were able to feel empowered and to take risks on that and, and do that. Um, yep, and I was able to leave my tools. So after that happened, I was able, and he moved on, I trained the other help desk person and ultimately when I left this job, he was able to replace me and contribute to the modules and it's such an exciting kind of full circle moment to develop these tools, to train the next person and then to have them be good. And they're doing their thing, they're on their journey. That felt really good and I felt wicked good about leaving the job knowing that things were not in a terrible state. Um, and it felt like I kind of came full circle in doing that like with them, so starting off with kind of fumbling through things and not really being able to teach them to leaving it with like this pretty good relationship where we'd both been enriched by the process and it's cool. I really uh, love having relationships with people after you leave a job and just having that impact. It's very fun. Um, so get hired at a new company. This company is quite a bit more skilled, like the employees they hire for is quite a bit more skilled and our team hires for PowerShell talent, not like crazy, but you have to be able to like script in PowerShell. Um, and I was excited for this situation because I wasn't the only one at this company who could do PowerShell. Um, so I had a coworker who I identified and he wanted, showed some interest in learning more PowerShell. Um, he had done some scripting, no modules, quite smart. Um, we kind of dabbled on a few PowerShell things. I think we did a PoshBot module that did something and you know I kind of went through how to create a module with him, just the basics of PSM1 and PSD1 and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we had a huge challenge in front of us. There was a process internally that was quite manual, quite complex, um, to the point where it's almost like artistry uh, to diagnose what's going on, right? Like there's multiple factors at play and stuff like that. And so it took a lot of documentation. So the first step I did was I knew this could be automated. I didn't have the time to like figure it all out at once, but what I did was I started slowly documenting the problem and documenting the process and what we would do if this happened and what we, just kind of getting a feel for the situation and documenting the process as well. 
Um, because worst case, you know, you're better off for documentation, even if you can't automate it. You can automate what you can, but I love documentation. Okay. Um, so I mentioned we did the Poshbot plugin, and um, yeah, so once I had the documentation and a good grasp of what the problem was, uh, I figured that this was a good situation to give to someone else, to give them that confidence that I mentioned in the previous story. To have a champion, to have someone who sees things through a similar perspective as me, who's willing to kind of, through their experience, confirm what I'm trying to convey upon my team, like, PowerShell tools are awesome, we should develop more, we should contribute, we should you know, get to a better level where we're all contributing uh, to PowerShell. And um, so yeah, I gave it to him, or I didn't give it to him, I, we worked together through the problem, there was a lot of pair coding, um, a lot of explaining how to approach the problem, but ultimately I only wrote a couple commands in it. And he did all the coding for it. And that was, at the time, his huge, uh, largest like PowerShell project ever. And it saved a ton of time for our team. It was a huge win, like not just in our team, but in the organization. It was a big one. It was mentioned in the meeting and a big, uh, like all hands. It was, it was huge for us. Um, and throughout the whole process, you know, we had like a way to give each other feedback internally. We have a tool we use. And consistently, he would talk about how it was the most enjoyable stuff he's ever done at work. It was the most gratifying. He's never enjoyed things more than that. And that was so freaking awesome to me. I was like, yo, I'm having an impact on someone's life? That's cool. That's way cooler than this code stuff. Like, that's real life. That's as big as it gets. There's nothing cooler than that. Um, I was like, dang, that's really cool. And we're doing stuff that provides value for the business. We're setting our team up to have more support and resources in the future. It's like, this is the way to do it. And we have more time to PowerShell. Our bosses are more into it. It's like, yo. Um, but one thing I did was I really made sure to let him have his win. Let him take that win. I'm not here to stand next to you and say, hey, I did all this. No, enjoy that. Let that be part of what uh, sets up your perspective to tackle other things. Um, and it just felt amazing to be part of that. Boop. We got a bunch of recognition, and it was, frankly, an awesome tool. And again, he had that confidence. Okay. okay, I mentioned it before, and it is so important, I believe. Creating safety. Um, so safe environments encourage learning and risk taking. And in order to learn, you need to take risks and make mistakes. And creating situations that foster that is going to lead to people learning faster and adopting things faster and not giving up more often, which is kind of what we want if we want to actually have adoption. So I don't know why I wrote if you want people to contribute and write code. Um, but yeah, if you do want people to contribute and write code, you need to create the technical safety for them. Right? You don't want to have a situation where, hey, uh, you can learn PowerShell, just don't actually run the command because you'll shut down the whole network. You, you kind of need to provide them some mechanism for safety. Also, when it comes to contributing to projects, like if you say, hey, you can write any command you want for this module and you don't have any testing, you're putting that burden on the person you're trying to get to write your code. You need to create environments that, that give them that safety. Like they're probably not advanced enough to or they may not be advanced enough to know about maybe Pester or certain other things you can uh, give them. Maybe a test environment, they don't have it. Seeking out and defining for them how to go about creating code in a safe way and trying things is, is pretty integral. And um, you want to create the emotional safety where people feel okay to ask silly questions. People feel okay to ask for clarification because if they don't, you'll have to teach them the same thing again that's less efficient, that's not, you know, that's not what we're going for. We're going for the most functional communication that we can, we can get, because it leads to less effort on our end, which is, which is awesome, and also better results for those around us. Um, so, boom. Uh, and in your own life, and in my own life, a huge part was creating safety for myself. And one thing that is important for me to remind myself of is that we actually all deserve that safety, right? If we're not feeling safe in life, that's against how it should be, and we're not going to be able to do our best work. Um, so this talk is a soft skills talk, um, which I'm not a huge fan of that term because I don't feel like it's as accurate as it could be. Um, I prefer the term meta skills because there's nothing soft about them or easy about them. Um, and so at a certain point in my journey, into this whole PowerShell thing a year or two. You know, it's the PowerShell and DevOps. So I, I learned some things from DevOps. I was in DevOps circles and 
hearing things about the importance of soft skills and how interacting with humans is super duper important. And I listened, and these were people who, they said a lot of things that resonated and sounded true, and they had other people saying the same thing, so I was like, yeah, this must be true a little bit. Like, it doesn't just feel true, there are other people saying it too? Like, hey, that's cool, I should try that a little bit. Like, it kind of makes sense. We are talking to people. I do notice that a lot of times there are issues when it comes to communication. Hmm. Um, so I kind of decided that it was worth taking a pivot and trying to dedicate some resources to meta skills. Um, so so uh, they're not soft skills, I refer to them as meta skills, and the hard skills should be referred to as domain specific skills. And meta skills are pervasive skills that are applicable to all domains. They're applicable everywhere, so they're worth the effort that it takes to get them. Um, especially for leadership type stuff, you're really going to need those meta skills. Um, Let's see if I have any other notes I need to mention about this. Boop. Yeah, early on, and I, this is the advice that I, if I could give it back to myself, invest in these skills way earlier in life. Way earlier. I would have loved to have all this experience. Um, so, boom. emotional intelligence is something that I'd like to highlight most importantly, because this is kind of where I recommend dedicating some efforts and where I dedicated a bunch of trying to increase my emotional intelligence. So. In life, I noticed that a lot of times I would see some people struggle consistently and other people would just be able to flourish and go right to the top of things and ask questions and be engaged. And it was like, what is going on? How are people able to do that? And the answer is almost always related to emotional intelligence, which I'll probably refer to as EQ from here uh, forward. So, so IQ is fixed, like your IQ doesn't really change throughout your life. Whereas EQ is dynamic and can be improved as you work on these skills and try to get better. Um, we can manage, oh, sorry, we can leverage our domain specific skills once we are equipped with the emotional intelligence to navigate around us and interact and uh, say the appropriate thing to the appropriate person. And um, I don't have any stats, but more EQ leads to more money. Uh, for sure, I can speak from my perspective and also there are numbers to back it up, but I didn't want to add a bunch of numbers. Um, and emotional intelligence is just a critical part of interacting with others, right? As time goes on, I've noticed that this topic seems to be getting a bit more coverage. There's like some uh, classes on it on Pluralsight and stuff, but I, I still think that it's heavily overlooked, like in a pretty major way. Um, and I think that emotional intelligence is one of those things that you'll continue to use for the rest of your life, and it will enhance your life. Um, so it can lead to a better life experience for you, which you deserve, and we all deserve. Um, for example, like if you notice that a coworker of yours gets upset when they receive criticism, if, with emotional intelligence, you'll, be, you'll know how to give that feedback in a way that your coworker can receive it better. And again, we're trying to have our message be received. And if we, you can say them in a way where they can receive it better, well, that's more efficient and you're not wasting time. And also, it's like you're creating a better environment for your team, that safety environment. Um, so very important stuff. But also not the type of stuff where like, I can just, hey, we're gonna learn about emotional intelligence, you'll be on your way. Like I mentioned, these are, this is more like a journey. Like these things take some time and learning them for you, your, your kind of experience learning them will probably be a bit different because your life experience is a bit different. Okay, so. <sighs> okay, emotional intelligence is about deeply understanding your emotions so that you don't become overwhelmed by them. Um, in the story earlier, I mentioned some instances where my emotions kind of we're leading the way, um, which is, I think, pretty common with a lot of things. So what are the components of EQ? So there's self-awareness, which is the ability to understand your own feelings and behaviors. So in my stories I shared earlier, my lack of self-awareness caused me to rush into things head first just because it felt good. I was clouded by that excitement. I was lost in the sauce. I forgot to pause and ask myself if I really needed to keep overloading uh, the help desk people with information. I was just going, it felt good, I was in my space, I was focused on me and not aware. Um, next is self-management. So that refers to keeping yourself in situations in which you know you'll be able to behave correctly. Um, so for me, as I learned and came to better understand myself, I identified what types of situations work best for me and I sought those out. So for me, I'm pretty good at working with people and getting them started on projects. Um, it's just what I'm best at. And putting myself in those situations repeatedly led to me having a lot more awesome situations for me, right? Being, putting myself into situations where I was going to flourish. 
Um, also, with that safety thing, creating safety for myself when I needed it. Whether that be telling myself, hey, if this blog post doesn't reach anybody, totally fine. If there's 10 mistakes, totally fine. Giving myself that like little blanket of like, there's some deep fears perhaps or some other experiences, let's just toss a little bit of a safety blanket. We're gonna be all right, we're gonna keep it moving and keep making some more positive experiences. Um, next is social awareness. So once you understand your behavior and feelings, you'll better understand how to read those around you. Um, so after being more aware of things, it's much easier to deliver my message to people in a way that works best for them. Instead of just saying what comes to my head and feels right to me, I was able to cater to them. Um, and a big part of that for me was noticing body language. Um, like and actually paying attention. When people were looking rejected or looking not interested, actually responding to that. Um, yeah, that was a big one. Seeing when people look shut down, you shouldn't keep piling on top. Um, definitely, definitely very important there. Uh, and then the last one is relationship management. So I found that as I kept working on things, I was able to have better relationships with people because I wasn't seeking validation from them. And in your pursuit of emotional intelligence, don't forget to extend the kindness, forgiveness, love, support, empathy, and safety that you would extend to others, right? We're talking about extending this to others, but you should first extend it to yourself because it's not really sustainable to do it the other way. Um, yeah, earlier when I received validation from others while also not giving myself the credit that I deserved, uh, it's just an example of the dysfunctional outcomes that can happen when you seek things externally that are not present internally. Uh, kind of a weird distinction. I know we're getting a little bit deep, but for that, it's very important, I feel. Um, and for me, I've had a bit of a complex life earlier, uh, and I found that like just reading a book about emotional intelligence wasn't enough to help me get through the struggles I was experiencing and like just the kind of confusing things I had going on inside. So for me personally, I found uh, consulting a professional, like a therapist, was super impactful, humongous ROI in my life, huge, highly recommend it. Um, even if you don't have like a tumultuous history, uh, it's quite worth it just for the performance benefits. Like, you, it's really nice having an expert be able to advise you and provide advice because humans typically are pretty bad at providing advice. Although we're quickly willing to do it, it's usually not very good. Um, so I definitely recommend that. Okay, so that sounds cool. I've said a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of emotional things, um, and it's kind of just some feelings. There's no real direction. Where do we go from here? Well, the best place to start is with you. So no matter where you are, perhaps you're quite emotionally intelligent and you're feeling the benefits of that and uh, you're, you're great on your journey, you're feeling awesome about it, um, it's still worth it to start on you. And if you're good, awesome, you can kind of proceed from there. Um, but you should definitely fill up your bucket before trying to fill up the bucket of those around you. Like you hear on the airplane, if you flew here, put on your oxygen mask before helping those around you. It's so important. We are trying to to move forward and learn and grow and be efficient. But if we do things in a way that's not sustainable and they come crashing down a little bit, that's just not what we want. So let's make sure we're taking care of ourselves. Um, it seriously is so important. Um, yeah, and it's a little bit dysfunctional to try to give to others without giving to yourself first. Um, it's unsustainable. So self-love is a sustainable and renewable resource, whereas external validation isn't. And it's so, man, as soon as I started giving this kind of like kindness and appreciation to myself, I found like weirdly, I was like, yo, I'm able to like learn a lot faster. I'm like able to be like a lot less frustrated at myself and at life and like move forward. And to me, that was freaking huge. Like, you know, as humans, we go through our whole life experiencing things a certain type of way. And to have that perspective change a little bit for me from something like just being kind to myself, just being as kind as I would be to a stranger, just like do that to myself too. It's like, dang, that makes sense. But uh, applying that to my life was humongous. And also take care of yourself because you deserve it. That's a phrase that I really love hammering into myself because I didn't always believe it, right? That I deserve to be taken care of. I deserve safety, all these things. Um, but by saying deserve, I love that word because it's true. We really deserve to be safe. We deserve to be taken care of. That's our state that we do best at as humans. Um, and I hope that you can seek out those. So embark on your journey, take risks, make mistakes, find your purpose and your way to contribute. Um, and this is a book that I really recommend, Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Uh, check it out if you're interested in this. It does a pretty good job at actually really laying out these things and kind of giving you examples of in the workplace situations. And if you get the audiobook, it's actually kind of funny because 
the author or the narrator or whatever uses different voices, and then, like, it's not a very good, like, he does a woman voice, and it's, like, half uh, efforted, it's, it's interesting. So that's the end of our talk. We made it to the end. Thank you all. Oh, five-minute warning, yes. Um, are there any questions? I imagine it would be a kind of a, to go from the deep emotional to just, oh, yeah, let me just switch over. But um, well, it kind of depends on who your team is and kind of where you are. Um, but one, I, I look, it, it, like, if they're just, if you just see, like, the non-genuine smile staring at the screen. Um, also, frankly, just talking to your team and, and having these conversations in a kind way, where you're not, like, rude about, like, hey, uh, you're rambling in the meetings. You, you can approach and give that feedback in a way kind of catered to them that would, you know, give them a chance to maybe be more self-aware. Because a lot of people have no clue. And a lot of times I've noticed that in life, if someone is doing something that's, like, kind of fumbling around and affecting other people, they don't say anything. There's not like kind of a kind feedback like, hey, have you noticed that this is kind of maybe not having the effect that you've wanted? Um, and I think that if we can find out ways and get better at giving that kind of kind, constructive feedback to others, I think we can find a lot more positive outcomes a lot quicker. Right, right. So ask questions before diving into feedback. Great. What was the Ted Lasso quote so I can repeat it? Be curious, not judgmental. Be curious, not judgmental. Great. I think in a situation where you have someone who's kind of giving up, like it may not be ready for them right now, but as long as you kind of keep that space and that opportunity up for them, um, should be good to go. Um, in the future, if, if they do find themselves in a place where they're more ready to take that risk and go forward, because you never know in life, it can be pretty complex and it can be hard to learn new things and do new stuff. But thank you everybody for coming. I gotta stop it here, so thank you.